right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the second Indian Energy Minerals Forum. I'm Michelle Littlefield, program coordinator with the USDA Consensus Program. And just a little bit about our program. Formerly named Building Consensus on Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Storage, or CCUS, and Clean Coal Technologies, Consensus for short, is a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy Fossil Energy. The program educates the public, policymakers, industry, and stakeholders on CCUS and Clean Coal Technologies by hosting webinars along with a series of monthly educational briefings, conference work technical reports, and we release monthly news clips of CCUS and Clean Coal related updates. If you would like to join our mailing list, if you have not done so already, feel free to send an email to the address at the bottom of the screen, and we will add you as a subscriber. So welcome to the second Indian Energy and Minerals Forum with our friends at Sagebrush Hill Group, LLC. And with that, I would like to introduce their president, Mr. Derek Washman. Uh, thank you, Michelle, and Yate, everybody out there. Uh, as Michelle said, I am Derek Watchman, and I am a member of the Navajo Nation. And um, clan wise, it's Ice Kidney and Shlin, Kohana, Vashashin, Kutna Zani, Desha, Cheyado, Tabash, and Nella. And I'm originally from a little town called Navajo, New Mexico. That's where I was uh, raised, and right in the middle of the Navajo Nation. So. But it's it's my honor today, along with Steve Gray, and I don't see him on here right now, but uh, Sagebrush Hill Group, my company, along with Steve Gray, we were asked to to support the Department of Energy and their fossil energy program, as well as the United States Energy Association, you know, to try to try to look at and try to, you know, come come to some, you know, some terms, if you will, with tribal energy development. And so I, you know, I know everybody on this call here, we've all been in the business for, for many, many years, you know, trying to spark and improve our energy economies and, and many of our reservations, you know, are prime and have access to uh, natural resources, you know, including oil, gas um, and coal. And a lot of the tribes are moving in the direction of renewable energy. Uh, but through our work with the Department of Energy, you know, we were asked to, to reach out and, and, and touch base with Indian country. And so this is our webinar number two. And so uh, we, we have an esteemed panel that everyone will see here and I'll introduce them shortly. But the, the goal of, of these webinars and, and you can tell by the agenda is, is how, how do we get at practical as possible? And so, you know, in many cases, and you know, I, I'm, I'm obviously guilty of this as well, is, you know, we start talking about our qualifications, you know, and, and we try to market ourselves and we try to get into infomercials and which is good, which is good. But, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, we believe, you know, through the Department of Energy and USDA and, of course, Stage Press Shield Group LLC, you know, how do we how do we unpeel the onion, if you will, so that we can really look at, you know, some of the, the major challenges, hurdles, as well as opportunities to to move tribal energy development and so that that's the big purpose for these for these webinars so i want to you know obviously pay, pay special um uh thanks to steve winberg who's the assistant secretary at the u.s department of energy over fossil fossil fuels and fossil energy we, we thank him of course lou hartman and others and of course we thank the united states energy association for their help and so um uh, i'm not sure if steve gray are you on the line you may not be. And so, uh, so, so today, uh, if you look at the agenda, we did ask Steve Winberg to join us, but he is um, unfortunately detained. And so he is unable to give some hello and, and introduction remarks from the US Department of Energy. And so, um, so, but I guess on, on behalf of DOE, you know, we thank everybody for, for joining us. And so, uh, for in terms of some housekeeping rules, let's see if we can keep our microphones muted so that you know we can hear clearly. Um, if you have any questions, we do have a, a chat bar. And if we have time, if we have time, we will answer questions. And so uh, the the agenda today is is primarily we're going to hear from Mike Ledick with the department uh, with uh, excuse me Key Bank, who will talk about energy financing. Next, we'll have Mark Cruz and Johanna Black here from the Bureau of Indian Affairs talking about tribal energy resource agreements. 
And then we'll move on to Roger Frawa, who is with, who, who is president of his company, Coda, and he'll talk about tribal energy, tribal perspectives. And then we'll end with uh, some comments and some insights from our chairman, Mark Fox, who is the chairman of the Mandan Hidatsu Arikara Nation. And he'll talk to us about you know, tribal participation in energy. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And Mike and I go way back, you know, in, in our banking days, Mike is with Key Bank. And at, time, at that time I was with Chase Bank. And so uh, Mike has been with Key, Key Bank for many, many years. And he's the national executive for the Key Bank's Native American Financial Services Group. And so uh, Mike, welcome. And I'd like to turn the time over to you to talk about tribal energy financing and and the way I, what we call it here is a candid discussion. And so the floor is yours, Mike, and welcome and thank you for your time. Absolutely, uh, uh, Derek and uh, Steve, once he joins, uh, thank you for the forum, Mr. Chairman, good seeing you again. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting uh, discussion that access to capital is always something that is sometimes more of an aspiration than a reality. Uh, and it certainly applies to Indian country in a variety of different ways, energy uh, notwithstanding. The, the issues associated with uh, the access to capital are significantly uh, the challenged based on the education of the individuals that have the capital and being able to provide it to sovereigns and understanding that the risk associated with it is sometimes less than what it is in the commercial sector at large. Um, the, the stability that Indian nations have is sometimes underappreciated by those folks, especially if, if the financial institution does not have experience in developing relationships with Indian country. Uh, over time, if those financial institutions take the time to invest in the understanding of the stability of Indian country, they will find that that segment of the market, whether it's providing capital to the governments, the business enterprises, uh, unlocking the natural resources and developing energy, for whatever reasons, you'll find that it is one of the most stable and safest places to develop financial partnerships. Uh, that being said, the reality of access to capital, especially as it relates to energy, and especially as it relates to energy in Indian country. I want to take a couple of uh, the components of that energy sector that um, uh, Derek initially described, renewable energies, fossil fuel, and then the mineral side, but really focusing on oil and gas and the uh, renewable energy space and what the financial community sees as the requirement to provide capital. Uh, so with that, uh, maybe we can flip to the next page and uh, give you an opportunity to see what, uh, uh, one, one more please. What we're seeing in the energy markets discussion, and this is really focused on oil and gas. And here's a, a backdrop into speed bumps that are looked at by financial institutions that are looking to provide capital for oil and gas businesses, whether it's commercial or uh, in the Native American space. What you see here is a, a summary year by year from 2015 through 2020 year to date of the bankruptcies in the oil and gas business. So clearly extremely commodity sensitive, highly capital intensive, and depending on where the prices were, that really drove the access to capital. Uh, and with the benefit of hindsight, the risks associated with it were not really evaluated. If they were, you wouldn't see 173.4 billion in charge-offs over the course of uh, five and a half years. That, so that's that's the, the roll up of where the experience has been in the, in the energy sector. And I can tell you that financial providers um, that had a big stake in some of those would not have made enough 
return on the investment that they had to recover their portion of $173 billion worth of losses. So what does that do? It creates a tighter underwriting environment. Uh, access to capital in any country has been difficult to begin with, but if you're looking at going to the bank market, which is the cheapest source of capital, and wanting to uh, develop capital so that you can continue to monetize these assets, here's what you're looking at. Uh, at the top, asset coverage, right around two times. So basically, you want to be able to loan 50% loan to value of the uh, valuation on the bank terms of what that oil and, and gas asset is worth. So they basically take the oil and gas price and establish some sort of a discount to that to value that asset. And that valuation of that asset then turns into a two to one coverage. So as an example, if gas, if oil and gas is uh, call it $40 a barrel, uh, there would be a discount applied to that, could be 10 to 20%. So you'd be looking at on a 20% on a factor, um, you're looking at $32 oil, $32 oil would be the basis under which that asset is valued and they'd loan $17 against that. That's what that translation of the two to one coverage was. And that's on producing asset. And there was a time where a non-producing, uh, proven developed, proven non-producing res reserves had a value uh, in terms of being able to access capital. That is no longer the case in terms of today's environment. Obviously things are gonna change, uh, but the tight capital access for uh, oil and gas has simply gotten tighter. And that's really an important point because proven uh, undeveloped resources do have value today. They have not been discounted significantly in terms of being an asset that can be leveraged in order to secure capital. Leverage is another big issue, and it's basically a, a multiple of EBITDA. And the, it wasn't uh, uncommon to see oil and gas producers leveraging up to about six times. In today's environment, kind of given the uncertainty and the volatility of the commodity, uh, three and three and a half times funded debt to EBITDA may get you to turn some heads. You might be able to get some folks interested in the bank market, but expect some covenants that would say, we want you to take this business over the course of time and leverage under two times. So we'll, we'll start you off with a, a three times covenant um, and then begin to lower that and that's done through reductions of the covenant that coincide with the revenue generating activities. It, it, it's really, really tight. Uh, in pricing, so you, you add a kind of another hurdle to the access to capital. You're, you're, in today's environment, uh, in the oil and gas space, three to 400 basis points over LIBOR with a LIBOR floor of one. So a LIBOR floor of one, uh, 400 basis points over that, your coupon to get access to capital at a 50% of value of that reserve is 5%. Um, and then in addition to that, in order to help mitigate potential impacts of the commodity risk, uh, the bank market in general is looking at a 50% hedge on a rolling 24 months, basically developing some certainty into what 50% of that production will have in terms of a return. And obviously, Hedging has its pluses in terms of uh, acting like an insurance policy, uh, but then there's upside that's lost if you're uh, locking yourself in on prices. Um, and then there are restrictions on what distributions can look like from the business. And they're typically uh, two and a half times, uh, once you're under two and a half times funded debt to EBITDA, those restrictions begin to allow distributions and they're really funded uh, only from free cash flow. So it's not, if you've got an access to availability on your credit facility and you want to leverage the asset, it really is, if you want to make distributions, it's got to be demonstrated from free cash flow. Uh, again, probably one of the most unfriendly markets today in the oil and gas sector, if you're looking for bank-based financing, uh, which theoretically is the cheapest source of capital. Uh, and then you add on lender friendly provisions. So the constraints around access to capital will include 
um, the provisions of, um, you know, not hoarding the capital and ensuring that there's a, a deposit account agreements and expect some waterfall and, and uh, deposit account control agreements that uh, flow into those agreements. Uh, and then the other component to ensure there's some financial capacity and stability in the business, you get a credit facility, let's say it's $100 million and you've got, you meet all of the criteria in terms of advance rates, et cetera. The, one of the conditions that a, a bank or a bank group would look at, look at in order to deploy capital into oil and gas would be that they wanna make sure that you're not using all of that capacity initially for existing operations and would like to be somewhere in the 50% funded of the commitments that are out there so that there's a 50% cushion of capital availability for um, kind of the, the support of the business and typically for growth of the revenue streams. Uh, and it was one of the, one of the, um, one of the objectives that I wanted to get to was to answer the question that, that Derek originally posed to me. There's a lot of infomercial, there's a lot of, uh, of capacity building, there's a lot of uh, communication around, yes, we have an appetite, and that can come from any financial institution. Uh, but once you get into the negotiations, expect something similar to this. Capital access in today's environment in oil and gas is extremely tight. It's not non-existent, but it's not very user-friendly either. Um, so, so with that backdrop in the oil and gas sector, uh, I'd like to evolve to renewable energies and what we're seeing in the marketplace there and what an individual can expect. Slightly better environment, uh, but typical themes relative to restrictions, typical themes uh, relative to conditions precedent before really getting into negotiations on what capital access can look like. Um, and so let's take a look at that in the uh, in the renewable energy space. And, and it's typically in the renewables, the most common are obviously wind and solar. The, uh, and there are some uh, projects where hydroelectricity is, falls into that particular space. But these are the very common themes. It's a purchase power agreement. So in the event that there's an energy project that is started or yet to be developed, uh, the expectation for accessing bank-based capital or renewable energy is you gotta have a purchase power agreement in place. Somebody's gotta buy, somebody has to have been committed to buy that energy. And it has to be typically a rated utility. So it can't be um, you know, a rural utility that doesn't have a rating, you're probably not gonna get turn the heads of energy providers to help you monetize your renewable energy project. It's a rated utility. What the market has seen is that there are corporates that are interested in, in uh, accessing direct uh, energy sources and they are also entering into the marketplace. So rated utilities has also made room for uh, rated Companies. So you got uh, you got Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet, Facebook, Walmart. Organizations like that are looking at developing energy sources, resources, and doing them directly, and kind of managing their own uh, access to that energy and, and developing a relationship that's not through a utility, uh, and they're part of a, a broader base of clients. And then there's the interconnection agreement, and it has to document that the power generated has an outlet. So you've got a PPA. You've also have to ensure that you put together the transmission of where it's generated to the end user, and those interconnection agreements are all identified, and they're developed, and they're tight. And then obviously, going through the contract and the permitting processes, uh, stuff like the, the uh, turbine panel supply and major agreements, going through all of the required permits, state, local, and tribal government conditions that are all met and ensuring that there are uh, the considerations that are uh, <clears throat> provided for environmental and wildlife issues are all in place. And getting 
obviously the construction contracts, engineering procurement, uh, known as the EPC agreements, and the balance of plant, the VOP and, and uh, transmission substation contracts. So as you can see, there are a number of critical steps that are involved in uh, having transmission and uh, from a power generation to the end user, everything that happens in between has to be developed and tight. And then there's a financial model that the financial institutions will look at based on what it takes to generate the power, what, it, what you have in the PPA in terms of its cost, and then developing a, an analysis on all, are all the costs covered, uh, what kind of cushion is there between the costs and the, uh, the price that's being paid by the purchaser and uh, ensuring that there's a sensitivity analysis that provides some sort of cushion in the event that there are any unforeseen problems. Um, and in this instance, uh, I think this is probably one of the most uh, positive components of uh, financing energy projects, whether again, commercial or tribal. And, and here's where I think tribes really have an untapped uh, or underrepresented market, and that's in the renewable energy space. E equity contributions uh, 10 to 15 percent, so you can get you know 90 percent financing with all of these other conditions in place. It really is a rather simple financial analysis that's being put together on these renewable energy projects. Uh, I can generate power for X. I've got all of the interconnections put into place, and I sell it for Y. X and Y has a positive delta to it in terms of free cash flow. Uh, and there's a financial model that, that makes sense. And uh, there's, there's a lot of demand for renewable energy in the marketplace in general, uh, and certainly financial capacity is better, at least in today's environment, for renewable energy uh, projects than unfortunately today in the fossil fuel industry. So um, with that, maybe I can stop uh, and, and see if there are any questions that, that arise from, from this. Uh, or uh, if not, then uh, we turn it back over to you, Derek. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate that. And um, it looks like it's a double-edged sword when it comes to access to capital in any country. But I think what I'm hearing from you is that uh, I know that a lot of tribes are delving into the renewable energy side. And so it looks like, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier prospect for that side. But we still have in this country tribes with a lot of uh, capacity when it comes to fossil fuels, and so um, you know the, there is there is possibilities, and so uh, good good presentation, and and thank you for that. And so uh, we will accept questions through the chat, and maybe we'll get to that to, at the end. So by the interest of time, we will keep moving forward, and so. I next want to move to our tribal energy resource agreements discussion. Uh, Mark Cruz, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Policy and Economic Development, and of course, Joanna Blackhair, who is the Deputy Bureau Director for Trust Services, they're going to speak to us about the Tribal Energy Resource Agreements. And, and Mike, you mentioned that earlier, you know, one, one of the components that's needed is all the permits. And so uh, I, have been tra I have been tracking too much the, the Tribal Energy Resource Agreements, but I know that Mark and I have talked on a few occasions about, you know, speaking to this and, and, you know, trying to understand how it works and its relevancy. So without further ado, I want to thank Mark and Joanna for joining us. And so I'll turn it over to you, Mark, to tell us about the Terra and the ins and out of that. So thank you, Mark, and the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you, uh, Derek, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm Mark Cruz. I serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs here at the U.S. Department of Interior in Washington, D.C. Today, I'm joined by our Bureau of Indian Affairs Deputy Director, Jonna Blackhair. Um, she oversees the Office of Trust Services for the BIA. Um, it's no secret that our administration has a profound commitment towards energy development, and that includes Indian country. The department has worked hard to work with tribal governments uh, to ensure that um, they are getting the responsiveness uh, from the department and the BIA uh, to produce energy of all forms, whether it's 
oil and gas, a uh, comp topic of conversation here today, wind, renewables, what have you. Um, we've been working hard to improve the responsiveness from Washington, D.C. all the way down to the agency level um, and working hard to clear backlogs um, in our APDs as well as rights of way and other land use issues. Um, we also are working hard to improve the environmental reviews and expedite those processes that make more sense for tribes and take into account their thoughts, views, and perspectives on the development of their lands. One very new, um, well, not quite new, but newer issue um, as of late is what we call our tribal energy resource agreements. And so the assistant secretary um, has put that the responsibility of the Terras um, on the BIA Office of Trust Services. And so today we will go through um, a little bit of, about uh, what a Terra is, um, what it's not, some of the process uh, that we've developed this year, um, and then John will be available for questions and some of the more intricate components to what is involved with the Terra approval. Um, before moving on to uh, the, the presentation, I do want to kind of illuminate for the attendees uh, how Indian Affairs um, looks at energy. Um, we kind of have a holistic uh, approach to it. Um, I oversee the Office of Indian Energy and Economic Development. Um, within that um, office, uh, we have our division of um, DEMD, um, Energy and Minerals Development. And many of you may be familiar uh, with that office because uh, the very limited discretionary grants that Indian Affairs possesses usually come out of that shop. And out of that shop, our staff, based out of Lakewood, Colorado, do a very good job of um, do working alongside tribes um, with their proposals and doing different analyses um, associated with any potential energy development um, on tribal lands. And so that is bifurcated from the BIA, which John oversees. Um, who do the more uh, uh, legal side and permitting side of that production, just so there's no conflict between the two um, entities. And so with that, we'll move uh, forward on the slide. Um, Michelle, I don't know if you're doing that. Oh, there you go, perfect, thank you. So what is a Terra? So a Terra is a Tribal Energy Resource Agreement. Um, this was enacted um, by Congress. Um, and it was actually an update to a prior iteration of Terra. Um, and the attorneys um, who do a lot of the work for all of us um, found a number of technical deficiencies in the prior iteration of Terra's. And so Congress went ahead and updated uh, that statute to make it more workable for the Department and Indian Affairs and for Indian tribes. Uh, these are agreements between the tribes and us at Department of Interior. Um, from the tribal perspective, once a terra is approved, the tribe may enter into energy related leases, business agreements and rights of way on tribal lands without the secretary's review and approval of each individual lease business agreement or rights of way. So another step towards our vision of um, great, creating greater tribal autonomy, self determination and self governance. We profoundly believe that Terras promote tribal oversight and management of energy resource development on tribal lands, and they provide another avenue under which tribes may develop their mineral resources. And it supports our national energy policy in increasing the utilization of domestic energy resources. Next. Um, for presentation purposes, uh, these are the citations uh, for the different um, statutes that I'm referring to, um, and John will refer to intermittently uh, through this presentation. And next slide. 
And this is where I'll turn it over to Jana um, to describe uh, what the application process and timeline look like from the tribal perspective, as well as the application process and the required content of a Terra application. Jana? Hey, John, I think you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, juggling between these buttons here. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So, after um, taking a deep dive into what the Terra application process is, you know, the tribe will provide the application to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And as we go through the slides, you'll see where the link is or the email address is. And we've um, so far had the opportunity to meet with one tribe in a pre-consultation process. And the pre-consultation was just a uh, in-depth review of what the Terra is and what we can do to provide energy related activities in a streamlined manner and, and um, working with the tribe to identify what it is that they were wanting to um, incorporate in, in, into their application. So if you take a look at this timeline, uh, the total timeline to approve a Terra is 270 days. And in, a, in an initial review of another application for a Tito, it didn't take that long. Um, so we've really expedited our processing time and our coordination by utilizing the Indian Energy Service Center to um, track and monitor the activities associated with the application process. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This slide represents the contractable federal functions. If you can see all of these items here, we are um, prepared to work through the various types of uh, contractable federal functions and then the inherent federal functions. In that pre-consultation process, that's where we'll have the in-depth discussion with uh, the tribe and their interests as they apply. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Here's the required content in the application. And here is the address, uh, the format um, and the PDF will be the Terra, will go to Terra at BIA.gov with all of your supporting documentation. So go ahead and go to the next slide. An application must contain all of the following. So you can go ahead and read that. And I know Michelle and um, Derek will provide this presentation to you all so you can go back to it and as you start putting together your checklists on uh, what is contractable and what you are interested in, in uh, applying for. The energy related activities include examples such as pre-leasing functions for leasing, communitization uh, agreements, unit agreements for approval, right of way, and the 638 uh, contractable items from, Bureau, from the Bureau of Land Management and those, those items. Approval of the application for permit to drill, that's the APD and royalty compliance. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Here's the information of what must be described within the application and what the tribe is interested in undertaking in those business agreements and what could be approved under Terra. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Again, here are the authorities. The, it was first passed in 2005 with the Energy Act. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Here's some limitations that we've identified. After approval of a terror, the department must provide the tribe with all of this information. Access to the status and support of the, of the services that's also coordinated under the Indian Energy Service Office. Assistance to ensure third party violations or breaches of these terms and agreements within the business lease. That's all coordinated and conducted in that first contact with the tribe in that pre consultation process. So we'll understand uh, jointly what what can and cannot be done with uh, within these uh, authorities. 
Okay, go to the next slide. Um, Mark, go ahead and type a little bit. Yeah, about okay. Here. Thank you, Jonna. And uh, just, I know for the um, participants, um, the uh, the terras are quite dense and they are new. And I will say that um, we have not approved a Terra application yet, although John and her team are currently in the pre-application phase with a few tribes. Um, but we are very cognizant of the, uh, the in-depth and the details uh, that are needed in order to submit a successful application and something we look forward to continuing to work through um, and having conversations with tribes uh, so that we can improve this system. But just understand that I know it looks dense and complicated and it is, and uh, we are fully aware of that and look forward to uh, getting our first one done and taking lessons learned from that. Um, also, authorized um, at the end of 2018 was the uh, TITO. Um, so we have Terras and TITOs, uh, more acronyms to throw around. And what TITO represents is the Tribal Energy Development Organization. Uh, this would be any enterprise, partnership, consortium, corporation, or other type of business organization that is engaged in the development of energy resources and is wholly owned by a tribe. And any organization of two or more entities, at least one of which is a tribe that has the written consent of the government bodies of all tribes participating in the organization to apply for a grant, loan, or other assistance under 25 USC 3502 or to enter into a lease or business agreement with or acquire a right of way from a tribe. So it either needs to be wholly owned by a tribe or you need to have all of the tribal entities if it's going to be um, multiple um, parties involved in the TITO. Um, next slide. Again, for the attorneys on the line, here are the uh, citations uh, for legal authority. Um, again, this presentation will be made available to all of you, so you can refer back to it. So I hope you're not scribbling feverishly. And then next slide. And here I'll turn it over to Jonna to describe once again the process for a Tito and the required content for the Tito application. Just to um go back to a little bit about um, what a TITO is and what a tribe could um, discuss in um, any opportunities and with a TITO is uh, one of the questions that was asked in one of the pre-consultation was, can a TITO enter into joint venture agreements and serve as a grantee in coordination with our legal counsel and our solicitor, um, Steve Simpson, the response was yes, a TITO can enter into a joint venture agreement and serve as a grantee as stated in 25 CFR section 224.30. It includes any organization or two more entities that at least one is which of, is the majority interest owner of the tribe that has written consent to govern all bodies of all tribes participating in that organization. And they can apply for a grant, a loan, or assistance under um, 25 USC section 3502 and enter into a lease or a business agreement. So, you know, there's some options there under a TITO that would help expedite these business transactions. And as what this slide depicts is um, what we would do in coordination with the tribe and within the department to approve those TITO applications. Again, the tribe must be the entity that is responsible to providing all of the documentation to apply for a TITO. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So the process for submitting a TITO, you know, again, the tribe must su submit the application to the Department of Interior and contain all the regulatory requirements according to those authorities listed. The department has 90 days to review and approve the application and an additional 10 days to issue the certification. So 
we would carry this out in coordination and partnership with the tribe applying either for the Terra or the Tito. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Again, I mentioned that the majority interest would be owned and controlled by the tribe and the tribal land in which it is being, which is being developed. So there's the information there for you to provide the supporting documentation to uh, Terra at BIA.gov. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Upon receiving, receiving the certification of the Tito, may enter into a lease, a business agreement, or a right away with the tribes without the secretarial approval, as long as the scope of the lease and the business agreement does not exceed that of the Terra as established in section 224.85. So another way to expedite and streamline the processes for tribes to enter into these agreements, it's beneficial. And so, you know, we wanna make sure that we've, covered all the bases in support of um, the rights of way. I know that's a big issue out there, um, the business agreements and the terms of the lease. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Here's the um, Indian Energy Service Center's information. The Indian Energy Service Center is a multi-agency collaboration between BIA, BLM, Honor, and OST. Our mission is ex to expedite the oil and gas activities and standardized processes in this engagement within our federal partners. We also have federal partnerships with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, um, EPA, and Army Corps of Engineers. So they're also engaged in processing any activities that um, are coordinated with our federal partners at the local offices as well as through uh, central office. Currently, our acting director is Carla Clark, and she's been engaged at the local offices to support Indian energy development, conventional and renewable. Um, if it, uh, we found that efficiencies are gained by applying the streamlined improvements and offered recent development um, activities and training, uh, virtual training, standard operating procedures have been enhanced to support business processes and activities assuring that tribes are engaged in developing and providing the um, mechanisms for revenues. So Carla Clark and Albert Bond are the contact. Again, here's the link to BIA.gov. Indian Energy Service Center, dbia.gov, and then terrabia.gov for any of your applications. Feel free to reach out to myself and Carla, and we can coordinate any of these pre-consultations, any of the technical support to your staff to identify, you know, what it is you're interested in. And one of the pre-consultations was, you know, you don't have to go for everything all at once. You know, if you're wanting to identify Maybe it's the right of way process that you want to um, take over. And then we would give you the right of way training, start building that capacity, and you know, get you on the systems. With this um, environment of COVID, we've been able to we've been, been able to coordinate a lot of our online working mechanisms to best suit transactions that are pending and um, getting them approved and working with our local offices. So tribal administrative support and technical capabilities and our review processes have um, gone on. So I just wanted to share that with you all so that we can hopefully get some tribes interested and in, uh, started on this timeline that we talked about. So with that, I guess that's, oh, next slide. That's the last slide. All right, I guess if you have any questions, we'll be open to answering some questions. Well, let's let's give it a shot. Does anybody on our panel have any questions? Uh, we don't have the ability to take verbal questions from our audience, but um, real quickly, Mike or Chairman Fox, any yeah, questions? I don't have any questions thus far. Yeah. 
Hey, maybe while people are thinking of questions, Derek, John, can you talk a little more about the um, inherent federal functions list that we published um, in February? Yes, in support of the um, federal functions and um, identifying what is contractable, I guess you can go back to, I think it's the, the, um, oh, let's see, what slide is that? The inherent federal functions was, I think slide six. Uh, Jonah, which one were you talking about? Yeah, keep, yeah, keep going back. It's the potential scope of application. Yeah, right here. Okay. So, um, the secretary identified what was contractable for federal functions. And the Indian Energy Service Center has um, provided an opportunity to have an awarding official at the service center to coordinate these contractable federal functions with our federal partners, which is BLM and Honor. <clears throat> Section 202 is the royalty compliance part of um, the federal functions, and then BLM. Their federal functions that are, that could be contractable are the applications for permit to drill, the leasing inspection and enforcement and production oversight, and securing and enforcing bonds. So, in an effort to support them while they stand up their um, Indian Self Determination Office within BLM, we are coordinating that support through the Indian Energy Service Center. The inherent federal functions that are not contractable are the Archaeological Resources Protection Act and those permits associated royalty collection and distribution, and then the issuance of royalty order in the notice of non-compliance. That still remains the functions of honor. And we could share with you the secretarial order in the appendixes that was provided during the um, tribal consultations. That would be great, Jonna. That way we have that available for the record. So thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in in the interest of uh, uh, this program, let's let's move on. So thank you, Mark and and Jonna, for presenting this information. It's great. it's uh, a lot to digest, but you know, we'll get through it. And thank you for sharing contact information so that folks can get back to you uh, yep. with questions. And so. I'm going to now move the agenda on to uh, our next speaker and Roger Frawa, who's the president of Kota Holdings, and he's going to talk to us about uh, his perspective. He's been in the business for many, many years. Uh, I, I got to know him while he was at the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, and since then, Roger's been doing a lot of work, you know, on on the energy side for tribal uh, tribal concerns. And so, Roger. So welcome and thank you for joining us. And so the question to you, the topic is travel energy developable or not. It's kind of a big question, but um, I know that you have your slide here. So I will turn over to you for your comments and perspective. So welcome, Roger, and thank you for joining us. Well, Derek, thank you for the invitation and um, to you and the rest of the hosts and the uh, the participants and the co-presenters, it really is an honor to be here. You know, this is a, a very different format, I'm sure, for all of us that we're probably uh, getting used to. And if not, uh, we're going to get used to it um, in terms of the uh, COVID impacts to our, our meetings and our convenings and, and whatnot. Uh, COVID has also had an effect, I know, on the uh, tribal or Indian energy sector as well, both on the production and the uh, consumption aside. Um, before we get into that important question that you asked us to tackle, which is uh, Indian energy developable or not, um, and I put in parentheses the or not and would like to get to that, but I think it's really instructive and important, Derek, um, to get to 
uh, the history, because if we don't acknowledge and understand uh, the history, then we're bound to repeat it. And I think when we start looking at the history of Indian energy, I think it's really instructive and important both, um, because I think we can just jump right in um, on financing or jump right in on policy points um, and make the assumption, uh, because we all operate out of our own sense of reality, make the assumption that we are all on the same page and we all have a common a common understanding. And I think that that was really apparent to me um, growing up, uh, so to speak, at the feet of the tribal leaders of uh, Peter McDonald, uh, Earl Oldperson, uh, and their tutelage and wisdom, um, and really understood that when the Council of Energy Resource Tribes and the member tribes uh, convened the meetings, they once in a while talked about energy, but most often time they talked about uh, customs, traditions, history, um, and that was very instructive, I think, uh, for the energy sector. And I think the or not, in parenthesis for my um, presentation and discussion, the or not happens more than often when people jump right in to the deal table, they jump right into the financing, they jump right into the policy discussions, and they jump right into the deal structuring without any acknowledgement of the history. And I think the history is so important, not just because from a native or a tribal perspective in our oral history that was uh, handed down to us from a uh, time of emergence um, to where we are today, but I think inside of our DNA, as we approach uh, um, the deal structuring table or the developable or not uh, decision-making um, uh, intersection, I think that you know we often wonder, um, you know, why aren't we able to move forward? Uh, and we sit here and we watch uh, uh, government, we watch industry um, kind of go right by us in terms of uh, the development. I think we have to acknowledge that tribes own 20% or so of America's fossil fuel or conventional fuel resources. And I know this is a fossil energy discussion. Um, and we also have a enumerated amount of renewable energy um, resources. So I think that when we start thinking about those vast resources that lie predominantly in the hands of the inner Rocky Mountain West tribes on the fossil fuel side and the rest of Indian country on the renewable uh, side, you know, we wonder why aren't those resources being developed and why aren't they being developed for one of the fastest growing sectors of the U.S. populace, which is the American Indian. You know, we're, going, we're growing at a rate of about 4% uh, per year. So when we start thinking about 4%, that's not a very large number by, by anybody's standard, but we're doing our tribal populations every 18 to 20 years. And when you think about, when you think about that kind of very uh, vast development, um, I don't need to tell the honorable um, um, chairman Mark Fox or, or anybody or any other tribal leader but that kind of development of our tribal membership really does constitute a lot in terms of how are we going to feed these people? How are we going to house these people, educate these people, you know, that are coming uh, into our tribal membership and our tribal roles. And, um, you know, energy is a big part of that community and economic development. So I think when we start thinking about the history, um, I think we would be very remiss if we didn't go back to our own origin stories. Um, and we talk about um, the colonization of America. The British Crown dealt with the tribes as sovereign through treaties. And then when the independence happened, when the U.S. placed American Indian Affairs uh, in central government uh, through the War Department, sometimes they treated us as sovereigns, but other times they treated us as uh, people to uh, make war with. Um, so they established, the, the, the U.S. established federal jurisdiction over Indian country. And that has a whole lot to do, that federal jurisdiction with Indian country and Indian energy um, as we understand it to today. Um, so the U.S. promised to uh, protect uh, Indian country from uh, settler encroachment. Uh, you look at the Northwest Ordinance, another piece of the, mo one of the most important pieces of legislation uh, in the Confederated uh, in the Confederation uh, Congress when the westward expansion and that sets that set precedent for public domain lands um, and tried to aim at um, positive relations uh, with tribes. 
Then you go to the 1790s, the Trade and Intercourse Act, a no sale of Indian lands without U.S. authorization um, and U.S. managed trade uh, with tribes on their land. Well, that has a whole lot to do with the basis of how we're structured to today. Then you go to 1824 and the, the, the formation of the BIA and uh, treaties and schools and boarding schools and trade and, and correspondence and then the Supreme Court decisions uh, from the mid 18 um, uh, hundreds uh, looked at uh, uh, Monroe and Adams uh, giving us uh, setting up uh, uh, reservations and giving us space uh, uh, and time to adjust. And then the Marshall Trilogy um, that looks at tribes as domestic dependents that has, that has a whole lot of impact on the way that tribes uh, in Indian energy is um, regulated and um, uh, produced today and with the U.S. as our guardian. You look at the Cherokee versus uh, Georgia uh, case um, and how the court ruled in favor of the Cherokee um, and uh, gave uh, the, the tribes a uh, uh, first glance at maybe sovereignty um, in the U.S. Supreme Court. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 uh, and the beginning of removing us from our lands um, and the westward expansion. Um, and we went from, you know, millions of acres uh, 138 million acres to 48 million acres uh, during those time frames. Um, so there's a whole body of history, I think, that is really important and instructive uh, because if we don't acknowledge that body of history and the importance that it plays in the regulations and the policies, the deal structuring, um, and the ability uh, for tribes, government, and industry to work collectively and together on the developable or not question. I think that that history really does um, pay a whole lot um, uh, of you know, impact into that. So I wanted to uh, not give a history lesson, but I wanted to go over that because if you look at the slide um, and, it, and you can have the conventional resources, coal, oil, natural gas, uh, nu nuclear energy with uranium, uh, the renewables with hydro, biomass, solar, wind, all that um, kind of resource on the left side of your screen where Indian country owns any vast resources um, of both renewable and non-renewable both. Well, we know um, that that um, industry uh, is the world's largest industry um, and there's no, uh, you know, it's the biggest lobbying group uh, in the United States. Uh, there's no bigger lobbying industry than uh, the energy sector. There's no bigger um, economic uh, sector than the energy sector. And we have such a big part to play in that uh, with our vast resources. And we know that the way that industry works is you develop those resources, you export, um, uh, dig those resources, you drill for those resources, those get put into pipelines or transmission lines into generation transmission and into distribution and ultimately into the customer base, whether those customers are, are American homes and in, in cities and in suburbs, um, uh, commercial, uh, government and industrial um, resources. And I think that there's probably nobody better to talk about the impacts of the industrial age uh, than Chairman Mark Fox and the, um, the development of the hydro dams uh, just off of his uh, current reservation and in uh, on his ancestral lands and how that kind of development and what Indian country has contributed uh, to this great nation and our American development um, uh, throughout history uh, because of a lot of our of our natural resources. You fast forward all that uh, to the Council of Energy Resource Pack, uh, tribes back in 1975. They had a good run up until about 2007. Whereas about 27 energy producing tribes came together and convened um, policy discussions and changed the federal Indian relationship. They changed the way that business was done uh, on Indian lands because they had industry and uh, tribes and government all in the same room at the same time. And I think that that made back in those days, I think that that made that development that development or developable or not. I think during those times, I think developable was much easier and more fluid because there was an aggregation of tribes. There was a sharing and a learning uh, between and amongst those tribes. Um, and I think that, you know, you, you look at what's happening today 
and the volatility of the marketplace where we've seen oil go from $135 a barrel down to $27 a barrel and how that has impacted Indian country and some of our, um, uh, of our economy. So we know that there's an oversupply of um, oil and uh, natural gas, you know, Russia and, and uh, uh, United Arab uh, Emirates is, is at price wars and affecting the, the global uh, price structure. We know that COVID has had, had an impact greatly on the energy sector because of the consumption. You know, the consumption is down. Uh, people aren't going out um, and uh, manufacturing is down. So I think when you, when you take that three uh, point hit on the energy sector of oversupply, uh, you know, we've got a lot more supply than we have demand. Um, we're not able to convert that into marketable or transportable, um, especially in natural gas quite yet. Um, and then the price wars and then COVID, all of a sudden it makes for a really challenging economy. So you think about the tribes like the Hopi, the Hopi tribe uh, with uh, Craig Andrews and others working very hard, looking to uh, explore um, uh, all kinds of resources um, and maybe looking at helium and things like that. Southern Ute Indian tribe, you know, I think one of the most prolific uh, energy tribes and companies uh, in the country. Uh, Bruce Valdez has left the uh, growth fund and now is sitting on the tribal council and helping to steer uh, from where he's at. Mike Davis, Blackhawk Energy at Hickoria, David Williams at Three Affiliated, um, and uh, uh, you look at what's happening at the um, Osage Nation and in Oklahoma, where all of a sudden through the Supreme Court case, you know maybe there's some new opportunities uh, in Oklahoma for Indian energy, which we hadn't seen uh, prior to that the Supreme Court decision, and being able to look at it uh, through a different set of eyes. When you start thinking about Oklahoma. Some of the richest people on the planet. He's a great guy. And uh, DiCaprio and Scorsese are making movies about the genesis of the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Well, that had a whole lot to do with Indian energy. You know, that movie that will be coming out here um, probably in the next 24 months with marquee names like Scorsese and DiCaprio uh, writing the script of how Osage's were murdered for access to the oil and gas resources. So again, when you start thinking about um, what that history means and how instructive it is for us as Native American and tribal leaders uh, who are all born exactly the same, knowing nothing, we all had to learn um, you know, the, through that history. So when you're sitting there and you're asking ourselves the question, developable or not, think back about that history and how instructive that history is to the deal makers at the table. So we can jump in and start talking about policy and finance, but if we don't talk about the human element, um, about what makes that deal and how the people are approaching that deal and what remembrances they have uh, coming to that deal table, I think it is very instructive. So not to belabor that point of history because I, I really think it's important, but to move on, you know, what's happening uh, today, self-determination, with a keen eye on uh, internal capacity building. I think that if we can start spending the kind of time, energy, and money focused in on helping to raise the entire fleet between tribes, government, and industry, um, and start with that historical context, I think would be very important. I think it's important for Kinder Morgan and those kinds of companies. I think it's important for any energy producing company wanting to do business on Indian land so they have a better sense for who they're dealing with or negotiating um, uh, with. Um, and I think that looking at that as um, an opportunity uh, to help grow a new generation of tribal youth, um, because I think that that's our most valuable resource. Well, I'm very proud of our renewable and our fossil fuel resources. And again, 20% of fossil fuel resources is not a very small number. You know, it's worth billions and billions of dollars. But more important than our coal, oil, or natural gas is our tribal youth. The tribal, re our youth is a renewable resource. And I think that we can start um, focusing in on the youth and developing uh, uh, really good capacity building. San Juan College has a, a degree program that is worth your uh, while and worth your look. 
uh, Colorado School of Mines should have more Native Americans involved in their programs uh, and, and a heavy recruitment process because of that 20% of uh, mine, uh, mining activity, mining resources. Um, I think that they are doing good, but could be doing a whole lot better uh, by recruiting more Native American students um, on, on those programs. And for us tribes, I think, you know, looking at uh, building partnerships and alliances, aggregating ourselves, um, and forming the kind of intertribal organizations that got us to where we are right now. I know that with the influx of Indian gaming, we've become very competitive between amongst each other. But I think on Indian energy, we have too much to lose and, and uh, too much to gain by not convening ourselves again and uh, forming some kind of a multi-tribal program and initiative, because I think that's where we started really affecting the federal um, Indian energy policy. So I think building capacity at the leadership, community and the staff level, um, uh, access to capital, as Mr. Ledick uh, was so eloquently talking about, um, and continue to live our own reality. When we think about Chairman Fox and the, the, the tough decision making that he has to do, you know, by balancing economic development, cultural preservation, and environmental protection all at one time. I'm not suggesting that CEOs or mayors or senators or congressional people don't have that same dilemma, but I promise you they don't have the same dilemma in the way that Chairman Fox and other tribal leaders of the 570 federally recognized American Indian tribes, because Chairman Fox's people are counting on him to protect their cultural preservation and environmental protection and economic development and do it with fossil fuels. Uh, try, try sitting in that seat um, and it's not a very comfortable place. So I think that um, removing policy barriers on our, our terms, removing triple taxation, uh, because Indian energy could be the cheapest and most available energy, but because of triple taxation, because of state, federal, and tribal tax, there is no other energy that is taxed in that same way. And I think that that uh, changed and you could unlock some of the vast resources that we have in um, Indian country. And I think that giving us the time to develop the resources um, according to our timelines and our cultural values, our social value, our values, I think that, that's what's going to make sense. To the extent that there's conventional fuel resources in the ground, that just means they're still going to be there in the ground. And I think as we keep depleting more resources elsewhere outside of Indian country, I think that those resources will be saved for the future generations of more sophisticated youth that we can start building coming behind us. Um, so I think that in closing, I would offer that um, uh, us as Native American tribal leaders, as professionals, Derek, Mr. Ledick, and, um, and others, that uh, we just maintain to be uh, the perseverance, the tenacity to be whom the creator intended us to be um, and working uh, that um, uh, and our commitment uh, in aggregation in support of each other. So. Um, Derek, I'll stand for any comments or questions that anybody has um, on that subject. Thank you, Roger. Uh, a very thorough and provocative comment that you made, so I certainly appreciate it. Uh, we'll, we'll save our questions for the end here. I know that we're running out of time, but I want to now move on to Chairman Mark Fox of the Pandan Hidatsa and Avrika Nation and welcome Chairman Fox. Uh, we appreciate you joining us and hopefully we save the best for last. And so I think Roger basically <laughs> provided a good segue to you. And I know that you've been a staunch, uh, a staunch supporter of trying to address dual taxation. Roger, the triple taxation, that, that's a new one for, for me. I understand what he's saying. So, but for you, Chairman Fox, thank you for joining us. And so the question in your perspective is what does energy mean to the tribes? And what does energy mean to you? And so the floor is yours and, and we look forward to your, your comments. So thank you, Chairman Fox. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Maz. Good. I appreciate that. I, I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Derek, are we okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, 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 yeah. Um, appreciate that, and and be your uh, saving the best last. I think sometimes uh, uh, what I'm tending to find is they always put me towards the end so they can say, "Well, we're all out of time," and cut me off. But I hope we, <laughs> we got some points out there. But 
but the here all, all due respect and, and you know Indian country is uh if, if anything that this pandemic and COVID has taught us is try to uh, try to figure out how to deal with the the white man's technology and that's for darn sure and so and, and it doesn't always go as, as best as we want it to we're learning that and it's not ours we're just simply paying for that service and sometimes I feel like uh uh I won a, a Hollywood movie I saw where the aliens take over the world, where the uh, where the humans trying to subversively get messages out there and they're interrupting our signal, and, and sometimes they're cutting out and things. But uh, you know, I, I want to wish everybody well. Uh, this is uh, you know hard times and and not always in a good way. Uh, the pandemic, what is done to the world, done to Indian country, uh, United States, etc., is is you know beyond measure. Uh, none of us had experienced this before, and I sure hope that our children and grandchildren don't. Although when they do, and if when they do, we'll be better better prepared, at least in Indian country. And that's kind of my hope. But my 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 prayers and and blessings to each and every one of you, uh, uh, Derek, and and, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, you know. Uh, Let's see, Michelle. Sorry, excuse me, Michelle. But uh, Michelle, thank you for your hosting and setting this up, making it work. And uh, I just want to visit real quick on the previous presenters. Uh, did an awesome job. Good job, uh, Mike, on on the key bank and opportunities for lending. You know, nothing happens in Snowball Rogers. That's how it works. And uh, oftentimes, we have a lot of resources, a lot of great ideas, but we can't make that connection. And and often more often than not it's usually fiscal in nature that prevent us from being able to capitalize these ventures and move them forward so it's really key that the country continue to focus on how to capitalize energy development or any development in general uh and as far as the, the department's uh presentations by uh jana and mark uh, thank you very much a uh, very important concept uh, i will say from our perspective on era uh, we have not yet, uh, we've explored it a year or two ago, we, uh, I think about two years ago, we were assistant secretary and others, and we did our best to try to how to make it work for us. But right now, uh, we don't feel that in its current version, there's enough latitude, uh, enough uh, clear cut advantages for us to move forward in that process. And so, and even though we remain greatly interested. So I, I hope in the near future, uh, the possibilities of Terra, you can see not a lot of tribes participate and, and there's a reason for that. So we need to correct some things. And, and if we do that, I think we'll, we'll go a long ways. And then of course, Roger, thank you for your comments uh, right on, on point on many of those. Uh, spoke very well on some issues I may not have to touch on now, but I, I missed the old days of CERT. Uh, I remember them and participated in them in the early years and my first years on council in the 90s. Uh, I wish we had another CERT organization or at least uh, somebody to fill those shoes, a new organization that would do the same thing because we desperately need a, a, a an energy resource uh, group that is tribal that can help advocate at, at a high level. We got, we're spread out too much and yet uh, we have a lot to do. So uh, I thank you for your update and your information though, and, and appreciate it very much. Now, one of the things I wanna talk about is of course, introduce myself. I am Chairman Fox, Mark Fox. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to represent our MHA nation. And, uh, you know, I, I thank this opportunity uh, to be able to present. Uh, you know, we have a lot to, to visit on, uh, so much going on right now with the COVID and what have you, but we're trying to keep our head above water, so to speak here. And uh, we need to continue to do that each and every uh, reservation and, and Indian country. So that being said, one real stark important point, and when we talk about energy development, uh, the most important point that I can share, I, I think, is to understand the lay of the land. More than 30% of the the non the established and proven non renewable energy resources in this country in the United States of America are country on uh, trust land and that's really that's a really substantial number and the point being is what can or what what have we done with it and and you know a day you know you see what we're doing up here uh, we're we were at pre pre COVID. We were at 
over 300,000 barrels per day. Uh, we're now getting back up there in about 240,000 barrels per day, but we're far from where we were at. Uh, but nevertheless, we are doing everything we can to continue to enhance our development through production. But at the same time, you know, uh, that 30% in Indian country is, is a, a remarkable thing, but it's also something that has has created a lot of and issues, you know, because from financing to rules and regulations, you know, there's multiple layers of regulations that, that hog tie us oftentimes when we want to develop, albeit they have great purposes. Uh, at the same time, it makes it really difficult to do that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're no exception to that. We're no exception to that. Here in North Dakota, uh, we, you know, we started about 12 years ago, our energy development plan and program, and, and we were forced forced into a dual taxation, first and foremost. Um, you hear me whenever I speak, Derek or others have heard me speak, uh, one of the biggest impediments to economic development, whether energy or anything else, is this, uh, this looming monster called uh, dual taxation. And basically dual taxation, as we all know, is simply where the, the state government comes in or counties or any external government comes in and says, we have a right to tax here. And before any development can occur, you have to have either an agreement with us or accept the fact that our, our tax is going to supersede your own. And, and that dual taxation where you have both trying to implement their taxes is oftentimes enough to drive away investors, drive away developers and producers, and anything else. So at some point in time, energy or otherwise, you know, United States government, if it really truly wants development in Indian country, is going to have to deal with this issue. You're going to have to eradicate the dual taxation problem, you know, created by, you know, a famous case, you know, cotton petroleum. And, and we need to get that done. Yeah, our example here in the United States, I mean, excuse me, in North Dakota and at Fort Berthold here, uh, you know, we're forced into agreement, basically said, you know, the oil producers wouldn't come in. So from 2008 to uh, present day, uh, the state of North Dakota has taken in two uh, tax agreements, original and modified and amended, have taken over $2 billion worth of revenue taxation revenue that coming from primarily uh, wells that exist, production wells that exist on trust lands within our boundaries, and $2 billion plus that the state has taken. And then when we turn around and we say, look, you need to put some of that back, we, you know, it's usually, well, you have your share, we have our share, and, and they don't put it back. Yet we're supposed to be citizens of the state. We're supposed to be, you know, uh, government to government relationship. Uh, we have no representation in Congress without the state. I mean, we're, we're, we're really having a heck of a time here. But when you have $2 billion that's taken away, but not put in back in the form of, of incentives, in form of, of, of uh, infrastructure and things of that nature, it makes it very, very difficult. And so we've been dealing with that. What happened when energy came in at Fort Berthold, you know, the biggest problem that we've got is nobody came in prior to the boom taking off in seven and eight, 2008, 12 years ago. Nobody should have, the United States government, knowing full well that it was moving on to trust land, should have came in and said, look, here's our problem. Um, you know, we're going to come in, we're going to allow industry to come in and have access to your lands. Uh, a study should have been done. Uh, millions of dollars should have been in put ready to say, well, if that comes on to that reservation, when it comes on, then what are we going to do to help this tribe and, and the local governments contend with all the, 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 the huge number of issues that they're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, deal with? And they never did do that. So it was learned a quick and hard way. And, and, and you know, and it just was thrust upon us. And so uh, our, our, our tribal, tribal government was really in it, and then nobody was really prepared for it. The federal government wasn't prepared. Uh, the state, for the most part, wasn't really prepared, at, not at that level. And of course, of course the, the, the tribe, uh, the tribe wasn't ready for it. And the only entities that was really ready for what they wanted to do was the oil industry. And then it came in fast and hard. And so, you know, from high traffic fatalities, tearing up our roads, you know, we've got environmental impacts, you got spills that are occurring, pollution to our air, all these number of issues that were, were out there, 
that uh, really made it difficult for us to participate. Albeit, you know, the revenues were there. Uh, we had to argue with that. That tax agreement we had to revise. It took us a, a number of attempts, uh, 2013, and then just last year, uh, you know, 2019, we were able to get back an agreement that we both could sign and, and end uh, a long time dispute over the sharing of those taxes, which put a little bit more of that revenue into the tribe's uh, hands to be able to build this infrastructure, to be able to deal with these problems. So the message to everybody out there, if you are either in the beginning ages or you're about to develop your resources, you know, you need to come out, see our lands, see other lands, talk to our people, talk to others who are versed because it isn't all uh, uh, royalties and revenue out here. There are so many issues that if you can nip them at the bud in the beginning, you can really go a long ways into properly enhancing, developing your energy resources. If anything, I, I, I want that message to be understood today that that's what we're really working hard and trying to do. And so, um, you know, I, I, I know we don't have that much time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna briefly talk about, you know, what are our goals here in our energy development? Now, I, I hear a lot of talk, and in particular, you know, the last one from Roger, you know, that's what we're all talking about. Derek, I know you spent your lifetime working on this is economic development. And because, you know, we, we are all aware that Indian reservations had our economies taken away or destroyed. Uh, they created federal dependency and made us depend on federal government while they took our resources. And so what we have remaining, we've never had uh, real opportunities to, to develop, not with the full support that the federal government should do. So, you know, but we can't do that unless we do a number of things. We can't change the social welfare situation unless you start doing some things for yourself. And albeit we might have more resource, resources currently than maybe a fellow tribe has, and we're trying to do that, but there are some basic things that need to be done. In, or, in order to reduce federal dependency and to be more self-reliant, you gotta start doing things like growing your own food, right? You need to start, have agricultural development. You need to have water development infrastructure, very critical, very important to tribes. Water plays a role in energy development and, and economic development in many different ways, and you need to make sure that's there. We need to start developing and exporting goods. We need to understand that it is one thing to be self-reliant and self-consumed, but you're never going to change your economy if you're just simply self-consuming. You need to export goods. If you want to change your economy, you sell something outward, external dollars come in and they circulate. That's how you change the economy. You need to have an established tax base. Evil word, that tax, you know, T-A-X, tax. A lot of people don't like it. But the reality is that's our governments are funded. And especially when you have a number of entities who have gotten into the habit of coming on Indian lands and, and developing economically and then walking away without paying a dime of tax to tribes. That's got to stop. And, and we've got to use that generated revenue to build infrastructure, infrastructure like roads, oh, infrastructure for bridges, infrastructure for all these different things that we have to play, housing, all these things that economically you will have to contend with as your economy begins to develop and you have to do that. But one of the biggest ones is everybody should be in a mode of trying to figure out how do we generate our own power? How do we generate our own electricity? How do we generate these things? And, and so that we're not relying on outside systems to provide that for us again. And, and so these are some huge significant steps that we have to take. Here at, uh, at uh, MHA Nation, we've, we've done that. We're, we're doing our own upstream, midstream, and downstream. Instead of just sitting back and saying, well, we'll take some royalties and a little bit of tax, our tribal nation is a, a what we call a sovereignty model. And this sovereignty model basically says, we're not going to back and just taxes and revenue uh, royalties, we're going to get involved with that development itself, upstream, midstream, downstream, and so that the revenue grow exponentially for our tribe and our membership. And that's what we're trying to work towards and all that. So we get involved with our energy development, but also we do spin-offs, a greenhouse project that's coming, capturing that flare gas that you see, the pictures all over the place, uh, so much gas in our air, uh, in, impacting our environment. Nobody's getting paid when it's burned into the air. And so we're trying to capture that for things like growing agriculture, greenhouses, things of that nature. And then we put $100 million in the rural water system as well, as I mentioned earlier. 
So, so through all this, uh, all, everybody that's online here and our guest presenters and Derek, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate this time and opportunity. So for us, in, in a nutshell, energy development, uh, our trust resources, we're not big oil. We kind of got caught up with this pandemic and with this CARES Act and, and no inclusion in stimulus. Uh, you know, we've been left out in the cold. Uh, we, we already lost three times or four times more than the government has given us. And so what is that teaching us? It's teaching us something here. As, as hard as things are, Indian country needs to wake up and say, look, but the next time a pandemic comes in, the next time some crisis occurs in the world or the United States, and there will be these things that are going to occur, make no doubt in your mind. We need to learn our hard lessons today. How do we prepare for when, uh, when, when, when the poop hits the fan? Guess who's going to be the first ones are going to have? Uh, uh, they're going to turn their backs on, and it's going to be Indian country. I don't mean this disrespectfully. It's just what is occurring. So the only way we can do that is to diminish federal dependency and start figuring out ways that when these things occur or even before that, how we can generate our economy and, and make things work. And so that's been my goal. That's my message. Derek, you hear it all the time, you know, less than federal dependency. To depend on the federal government for 90 or 100 percent of everything you do is going to keep you impoverished for the rest of your days and, and, and your and your your tribal nations uh, for, uh, for hundreds or thousands of years to come. We don't want that to be that way. We've got to make deliberate choices to diminish that and to move forward. Because at the end of the day, there's two things I want to just close with is that you know, if if the standard of living, if the standard of living, uh, we have a very valuable resource in oil and gas. If the standard of living of our membership doesn't increase in general, then we're making a huge mistake. We're almost better off leaving it in the ground. We don't want to have that same old song of energy came in, oil came in, developed, took the resources, made a lot of money, left, and then the reservation be worse than it was before they came in. And these are some of the things, and, and I, I wanted to share that. And then, and, and then finally, this this dependency again back to that is that uh, we we all need to understand that uh, there's no way in, in hell, excuse my language, but there's no way in hell that I see the federal government ever coming in. And I'm a United States Marine and honorably served. They're ever going to come in like they would a foreign country in which we we uh, engage in war on our, our bomb and. And, and, and do all kinds of things. There's no way that the United States government is going to come in and say, look, we really need to change Indian country. Let's put a $50 billion, $100 billion uh, budget together to go in and actually incorporate and, and, and cause this economic change. Uh, there's no way that's going to happen. Uh, it's a mentality. We have to change how we think. We have to accept the fact that that's not going to occur and then start moving and start doing some things. Uh, I, I thank you for sharing with me. I'm happy to ask any questions you might have, but that's what we're doing here. Uh, albeit, you know, it, it's not easy. It's challenging and difficult internally, externally, and everything else. But we're, we're moving in that direction the best we can, and uh, we're, we're hoping to take advantage of this limited resource and put our eggs in other benefits economically, and then so that uh, we'll be exporting and be a significant contributor to the economy of the United States like everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Fox. Very inspiring. And, and I, I appreciate all your remarks, especially the sovereignty model. And so uh, very, very good words. And so thank you. Um, we're going to we're going to move on to Steve Gray and, and I'll leave it up to him if he wants to ask questions. But Steve Gray and I are, are the ones that are putting on this this project in conjunction with the Department of Energy and USEA. And so Steve is, is out of Farmington, New Mexico, and he's the chairman of the Four Corners Economic Development Corporation. So I'll turn it over to Steve for uh, wrap this all, wrap this whole webinar up. But thank you, everybody, for all your time. So, Steve, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, boy, all of the talks today were very inspirational. Um, uh, but uh, ex that is exactly what we wanted. That is exactly what we want to hear. Um, because, you know, the whole discussion that we're talking about with the Department of Energy is 
is energy and, and what does that encompass? So I wanna just start by saying thank you to the Department of Energy for them continuing to support us to reach out to Indian lands and to communicate with Indian lands and get and gather information. That is very, very important. And um, USEA, uh, as their contractor who's been working with us to also help us on that, we're, we're really thankful on that. Um, and, you know, wanna, I want to start by saying, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves what's next. I mean, it's great that we're all listening and, and giving input on this big issue surrounding energy. But now we got to ask ourselves, what's next? What do we do? What are those things that we've got to do? Um, here in the Four Corners region, um, as Derek mentioned, as, our, as the chairman of the Four Corners Economic Development Group, we are constantly asking that question. And we have to do that if you're going to impact economic development. And that's really our goal. What, how, do we, how do we make an impact onto economic development? So one of the things that we, we want to do is continue this dialogue. Um, we've spread it across the whole country. And, and so one of the things that we're looking at now is looking at, at, looking at more at regions. In, in various regions, you know, those issues are, are a little different in every region of, of the country. So uh, Indian country falls in those regions. So that's one of the things that we want to do is look at it. We wanna have a much broader look at this issue as well. Right now, people say, well, I just do fossil or well, I just do renewables. But when you start to look at energy as a whole, you know, it encompasses everything of, of, of both of those. And so we need your input. And we, we've uh, scheduled these speakers because not only of their expertise, but also their view of, their, of what they see in their areas. And there's a lot more people out there that have these kind of, of viewpoints. And so we, that's what we need to gather. So I want to, you know, want you to think about that and provide Derek and I the input, your input back of what do you think now we should move to on that next level? We do have the Department of Energies here and, and that's very important. You know, they're, 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 they've listened, they want to see what can we do, but we've got to be the one to shape that plan. We've got to shape that strategy and say, this is what is needed. So I want everybody that's listening, everyone that spoke to really start to think about that because this is not going to go away. We realize with the with the virus and the pandemic that it, it slowed a lot of things down. But now as things start to come out of that, there's opportunity. We need to capture those opportunities. We don't, we, we need to not be at the back and saying, what if? We need to be in the front and say, here's our thoughts, here's our ideas, here's where we need your support. Because at the end of the day, we're gonna get out there and we're gonna make it happen. So I just want to conclude by saying, thank you everyone for joining us, for being part of this event, uh, because it's really important and we want to continue to work and talk with each and every one of you. Thank you on behalf of Derek and I. Thank you, Steve. Um, this, this will conclude our webinar. And so we will send out a survey and ask for questions. And if, you, if our panelists don't mind, we'll share the information with them. We also are gonna share the PowerPoint presentations and it'll be, it'll be at the USEA website and so uh, like like Steve said, uh, he and I are very supportive and appreciative of the Department of Energy's efforts in, through their Foster Energy Group, and so uh, they they obviously understand and really want to reach out. And so this is going to require everybody's attention and, and time and and thoughtfulness. And so Steve, thank you for your your conclusion. And so uh, I will end it there, but I want to say again, thank you for joining us. 
uh, Mike, and Roger, and Mark, and and Jana, and Chairman Fox. I really appreciate it. And um, if you don't mind, Chairman Fox, I'd like to give you a call after this because I have a dual tax question that I know that you have a lot of insight on it. So I, I will follow up with you on that. I'm, I'm helping the uh, TTAC committee. And so, so with that, I know that we're past an hour and a half, and I know people's time. I'm sure everyone's had to drop off and jump onto another webinar because you know that's what that's kind of the, the 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 process that we're working in right now. But with that, I want to say thank you and thank you, Michelle, for for being our host and and kindly you know working all the slides. And so with that, I want to say a hat to everybody, our panelists, and to our participants. And so we'll call this a, a very excellent webinar. Good information. And until next time, we will keep this product project going. So thank you, everybody, and so long. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone.